Okay, thanks, Michael. So um, it gives me enormous pleasure actually to introduce Professor Rhys Jones. Rhys is an Associate Dean of Education at the Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences at the University of Surrey. Um, prior to this, he was based in the Department of Statistics at the University of Auckland. Um, from a kind of personal point of view, he's one of the most enthusiastic people that I think I've ever come across in my whole life. So we are in for quite an interesting hour ahead of us. His sort of primary research are really contributions to areas of curricular development and importantly, the role of context in statistics education. And he's given this particular talk as part of the whole series of the St Teaching Statistics Trust annual lecture series. So I'm really pleased that he is joining us today. So Rhys, I'm gonna hand over to you for your brilliantly titled talk of Weapons of Statistical Instruction. Uh, thank you so much, Rachel, for the introduction. Um, just, to, just to highlight, I have flicked over an email with a link to the PowerPoint slides, so ha very happy for them to be shared afterwards because there's quite a few links in them. Um, and I've also, I did this talk for the Royal Stats Society a few months ago, and I've got a, a link to that, just if you want to look at, because I think this has been recorded as well. Um, I, I, I love your comment in, in terms of enthusiasm. Thanks very much for that. Um, I would say when I listened to the YouTube clip, I thought it, it seemed a bit flat. <laughs> so I'll, try and, I'll try and pick up and be a bit more enthusiastic for this one. Um, so um, I've got a PowerPoint to share with you all and the talk should last about 45 uh, minutes to 50 minutes. Um, and then um, as, as the uh, Michael mentioned, if you could drop questions into the chat I won't I won't necessarily keep an eye on that but um, when we come to the end of questions then we can perhaps work through them so um, so the whole point of this talk so so what's this talk and and um, why was it created so in 2017 um, the teaching stats trust was established uh, an annual lecture series for teachers of stats in all subjects, whether specialist or non-specialist, um, and in secondary schools, colleges, and early years of um, university. And, and um, the whole purpose of this talk is to encourage new uh, thinking, exciting approaches in teaching stats, with the ultimate aim that teachers and students gain a deeper understanding of the subject. So that really is my, my kind of learning arc and my hope um, from this talk. And I would say when I, I, I've given this talk about 10 times now, and I when I gave it in Newcastle, um, I was quite surprised that a whole class of A-level students turned up, um, which meant that I had to um, quickly adapt the teaching because um, I didn't want to kind of bore them um, with teachy, teachery type things. Um, but they seemed to enjoy it, which was, which was good. So my talk is going to come in three, three main parts, um, but I will firstly talk about myself and my own teaching philosophy, um, which will help um, give you an idea on kind of my positioning and where I come from in, in the way I view teaching and, and how that informs my own teaching practice and, and the pedagogies I use. And then I'll move on to three distinct parts. So firstly, I'll be looking at visualizations and the software that I use predominantly while at Auckland University. Um, then I'm going to move on to talking about context and challenging data. And I'll tell you what I mean by that in terms of the definition that I, I give to that. And then I'm going to talk about telling stories with data and statistical literacy. So I was... Um, raised by my grandparents. Um, I'll just say that, that what I'm doing at the moment now um, is called a pepiha. So when I worked over in New Zealand, um, it's a Maori term. And when you when you introduce yourself to, uh, and talk to your students and teach your students, you kind of tell them a little bit about yourself and your ancestry, um, which are, are very kind of key Maori um, elements in terms of um, how they how they view the environment and the world. And it, and it gives them an idea on, on, on where you come from. So I was really, felt really fortunate to be raised by my grandparents. Um, I always remember, um, I mean, this is clearly when I had hair back in the day. Um, and um, I remember being raised um, by two people that had so much passion uh, for science and curiosity. Um, them themselves didn't have the opportunity to go to university. Um, they were a working class family. Um, so I was the first person to go to university. 
Um, and I think a big part Please, of that- can, can, yeah. can I just interrupt? Um, yeah, sorry, the, yeah. The, the slides aren't coming out full screen. We're seeing the next slides and- notes. Oh, right, okay, okay. So it looked to me like you did try changing that and- Is that better? That's better. Yeah. So if, if, if you go to the next slide, does it change back again to that? No, that's that's going okay. Okay, sorry. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, if you want to start from that whole slide again, we'll just edit it out and it'll look very smooth. But uh, okay. Um, feel, feel sorry to interrupt. You can carry no, on. No, thanks. Thanks, thanks for much. letting me know, Kevin. I, I was wondering if that if that was coming through like that. Um, so th thanks for the heads up. Um, so yeah. So I was the first person to go to university in my family, and I did almost drop out in my first year. But I remember kind of getting a, a stern kick up the backside by um, a geology teacher, and who told me to basically pull my socks up and I, and I did. So it's great when you get, when you listen to people that give you that um, tough love sometimes. So um, here's my mum and my uh, dog Alfie, got quite a small family and, um, and um, my mum is like my rock, really supportive and, and really um, a, a just an amazing, inspiring person. So other things that I've done in my career. So I um, worked as a, a carer for people with limb disabilities and challenging behavior. And I did that five years, full time for a year, but mostly part time during my studies. And I think that really helped to facilitate that kind of caring um, uh, mentality and caring attitudes in the way I try and support my students and, and, and try and get them to, to be their best. Um, I stepped onto a plane when I was 21 and worked in summer camps for 10 months over two years in the US. And I, um, and I worked in a summer camp where I was a nature teacher, a biology teacher, and the, and the other camp I worked in was a special needs summer camp. And I've lived in New Zealand, uh, USA, Scotland, all of England, and being Grease Jones, uh, Welsh, obviously I, I'm from Wales. And so my own academic journey, my own path. So I originally started off as a biologist, as a biomedical scientist, um, did a quite a broad biology undergrad with big parts of st statistics within it. Always remember being interested in stats and the way people think statistically. Um, I did postgrad qualifications, master's in medical biochemistry and a second master's in immunology. I trained as a, a, as a lecturer, did a PGC in further education, and I worked at uh, FE colleges, which I really, really enjoyed and glad I had that ground in and before I switched and, and spent most of my career at university in a range of different roles. And my AD looked at the creation of uh, transdisciplinary courses in uh, statistics and research methods, with teachers and we, we created a, a level three, um, uh, an A-level equivalent qualification uh, in Wales. I've taught on a range of courses in FE and mostly in HE. And my time at Auckland, when I worked in the stats department, I was one of the course leaders for a, a, a huge module in introductory stats at about 6,000 students per year doing this one module. Um, and I also was a director of a science scholars program, which uh, was an enrichment program for people with high learning potential or gifted learners um, doing a range of subjects at Auckland Uni. I myself am a really strong advocate of working with student partners, particularly getting students involved in the research process and, and developing curricula and, and creating new curricula and, um, and piloting, piloting it out with them. So moving on to uh, my teaching philosophy, and I, and I think what was really important is to reflect on this quote from um, a Dutch professor in education, a good Bister, um, where um, we need to keep discussing how we, we think about education and, and how we uh, deliver it. And in particular, how, how society moves on and how that changes, especially with things like technology. Um, we need to really think about the purpose of education and in particular, um, for our stats and, and, and data science, how we do it and, and the value of that um, to people and to society. So two books that really, two people that really influence my own teaching philosophy and the way I, I view my teaching are Pali Ferrer and John Dewey in particular, um, who wrote this book, Democracy and Education. And this book isn't, a, 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 doesn't come with any kind of new ideas this was over 100 years old this book um, and what he was a really a strong proponent of was learner-centered education as a process of personal growth uh, and i myself a very uh, strong advocate of active learning learning by doing getting students doing things in the lecture hall or, or, or classroom 
and see and learning as a holistic enterprise where your curricula should be connected to local, social and physical environments and seeing learning as a collaborative uh, social enterprise. And, and, and that re this really links nicely, nicely to Vygotsky's ideas on social constructivism. Okay, so let's flip back to um, COVID, let's flip back to pre-COVID. And um, hopefully when we were given our, our lectures, uh, introductory lectures um, to students, hopefully we get really nice attendance like this. Um, I mean, it might it usually did taper off, I have to be honest, uh, for myself, after about a month, five weeks, you would start to see some numbers drop in, but you had people in the room, and, and I think this type of approach was quite common in universities, um, perhaps not uni unis like the, the OU, but for, for most universities on the planet, we would uh, deliver like this. And then when COVID hit, we got to this, and we had empty lecture halls. I remember at the time I was in Auckland, I was in New Zealand, um, and New Zealand took a very hard stance uh, initially. The planes stopped coming from China in January. Um, the borders literally closed. It, it was actually quite, um, quite scary. It was quite a scary time. But my initial concerns, my initial worry was for students' well-being and, and their levels of engagement. And I really felt that they would feel like this. They would just fall to sleep listening to recordings of lectures and perhaps even do this to make themselves appear like they are, that, that they are listening um, to two sessions and, and they're engaged. So this meant that a lot of us were doing this, we were working hard and, and I remember putting in a few 36 hour days. And I think for those of us that teach statistics and, and data science elements, the, the additional layer I think is that um, maths anxiety or stats anxiety, um, of which we know some of our students um, have. And the paper that I was teaching on, the module I was teaching on at Auckland, those 6,000 students, um, the reason why it's so big is because they're doing all different types of subjects like economics, psychology, um, biology, and they have to do this paper as a course. So we know a lot of the students that we're getting are gonna be uh, anxious and nervous and they tell us that they're, they're actually quite nervous about doing this. And what we really want them to see is that stats and data science and can really just really help enrich and make their disciplines come alive. And really, if they can develop these skills and use stats as a skill, in the, it'll help them understand their own disciplines so much better and also help them engage with research and, and collecting data. So first part of my talk is uh, looking at visualizations and insights. So, it's a really nice quote. Um, I knew uh, Helen McGillivray, who's a professor of stats in um, Australia, is one of her quotes that she uses quite a lot, but I actually really like it as well. And it's a quote from Tuki. Um, and the best thing about being a statistician is that you get to play in everyone's backyard. So the idea is that stats and data, it's, it's everywhere. It, it permeates into every discipline, um, whether that's qualitative or quantitative data. And it's, it's something that we can really utilize and help to inform our teaching of statistics. So the approaches that I took on that big paper that I mentioned, that big module, um, was to try and embed tasks and activities that are not always related to the course content. So trying to do some fun stuff. And what I found is that this had an indirect effect of engaging students with the course content. It promoted a self and inclusive learning environment, and it showed that I valued their contribution. So what do I mean? by all of this. So um, I'm just gonna show you uh, my uh, web page, my virtual, uh, my VLE platform that we used at Oakland. So we used Canvas. Can I just check, can you all see that? So we just type in the chat, yes, I'll know that you can see it. Fantastic, thanks, thanks, Karen. Um, so you can see here that I um, arranged my uh, learning page. So this was a, um, the students doing um, it was asynchronous delivery, so all these recordings here. This is this is the substantive content, but the kind of fun stuff. The way I was trying to engage students came over here on the right, and these just linked to Google Sheets. Um, nothing terribly complicated, and students could access and edit these, uh, which was um, really helpful. So, as um, was really helpful for us as people who teach stats. Um, you can ask them things about themselves, 
and you can use that in your teaching and you can say, look, this is real data, this is data on you. So I ask them, um, where are you from? Um, and we can look at these different variables here. Um, what city are you in? Where would you like to visit? And, and so forth. But also, um, I really wanted to try and give the students some element of choice. So I said, right, let's think about what we can do to keep us uplifted and entertained, give us some ideas. And I, I'd say some of these ideas are a bit, a bit out there and I really didn't use, but others I did. And, and I, I mean, I even, I, I understand that this is not everyone's approach, but I did actually sing Bohemian Rhapsody in a video to them, um, which I think it, it went down quite well. I, I do think I went a bit too far with some of these things myself. Um, but some of these things I've tried to also feed into the course content and, and, and try and get students engaged and hooked in that way. Um, and some of the ways I tried to get them involved and I say, well, what I think we know as teachers of our modules, the teaching stats and, 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 and data science, particularly stats, if you've been doing it for a few years, you know the points, pitch, pinch points that students are probably going to find difficult. But it's great if you can ask them, well, what do you find difficult? What areas do you find difficult? So again, just use a simple um, Google Sheet and um, pop it up. And then I'd arrange them into um, different themes, different topics. So you can see um, some students here are not understanding some of the terminology, some of the statistical concepts, like what does chance act in alone mean? Um, and looking at hypothesis testing and, and some of those other areas. So a really strong emphasis that I tried to, we tried to pull out in this module is right, we've got the student data, we've collected the data asking where are they from? I mean, for that particular um, data set that we had about, I had about 300 responses out of about 600. So I think that's that's actually quite good. 50% of the students are engaged with this. And what I'm really, we're really trying to do is to encourage them to keep asking questions and develop that critical thinking. And also for them to recognize that a lot of what we're teaching in, in stats isn't right or wrong, and there are shades of gray. So getting them to scrutinize visualizations and plots. What does the data mean? What details are useful? What assumptions do I have what I make when I look at that data? And then how can I use those assumptions to influence what I do next with the data? So um, some of the things that I did with the students, um, I asked them to come up with a name for themselves. And I would just say um, for that, what really um, surprised me is that they, well, they chose Reese Jones's diary, which, which was just a weird name. I don't know why they, <laughs> they, they voted for that. But the students actually went and started to rearrange the Excel spreadsheets themselves and, and put them in and clean the data. So that was really nice to see as well. And um, now the way that I would use this in my teaching is to use a piece of software, free software, called Insights, okay? And I'm just gonna show you this now. Now there's two versions of this. This was created by um, department in stats department at Auckland University. It runs with R in the background and you can either download it as an application, as an app on your desktop, or you can use it as um, uh, the web-based version. And this is the web-based version, it's, it's Insight Live. I would use this live on my teaching. Sometimes it freezes, to just refresh the page, um, but it, it's very intuitive, it's free, and students love to use this. So if I just um, quickly show you a quick demo on this, so you can um, go to file, import your data, you have your data saved somewhere, and if I just use this where you're from data and open it, you will know that the magic's happened, it's worked, because you'll see it here populate um, on the right in a table, and it recognizes the top um, row as being the variable name, so you don't have to type uh, type that in, which I think is really useful. And if you go to visualize, the uh, software will recognize the, the type of variable you're, you're using and look at the levels of measurement, and then it will plot them for you. So here we have a, a bar chart. Now, I think what's really useful about stuff like this, you can really use it as a springboard activity. So you can say, well, look, look at this data. You can obviously look at proportions and percentages, but also we've got three versions of New Zealand. So why is that? So you can start to talk about things like survey design, designing questions, um, some of the pitfalls and some of the, the areas and dangers you might fall into and how that influences the data that you create. Um, 
I will just um, upload a, another uh, data set just to show you some of the other features on this, but I would encourage you to, to look at this and use this in your own teaching because it, it, it's such a, a great tool. Now, this other uh, piece of information here, um, this other data set is on breastfeeding. So it was a, a study that was done where, um, where two different groups of uh, women uh, were selected, they self-selected onto the studies, so they were breastfeeding and non-breastfeeding. And a GCI score, so a cognitive index score, was measured in um, their children after about uh, age, up to age six. And then you can see the two findings here. And what's great, you can scroll along this. Here you can look at the summary, so it gives you the summary data. You can do inference as well, and it can give you examples. So you might want to do a two-sample t-test and it gives you the outputs and the, the p-values and that sort of thing. Um, and you can also go to interactive plots. Um, and a new feature that I um, noticed recently, you can go to this visual inference tool. Um, so you can do a bootstrap, a confidence interval, or a randomization test. Now, I'll just say that this, there is a separate module too. Um, this VIT is a separate program as well. Um, and you can do other types of uh, statistical analysis using that. So really, really great tool. The students love, uh, and I actually really like using live. So the I just showed you an example there in breastfeeding. Now, the, the great advantage of using this in New Zealand, and I really think the UK here needs to think about um, how we teach stats earlier on in schools and data science. In New Zealand, students down to year nine and 10 start using this software, using Insights, and they start manipulating data and visualizing data much earlier on than, than, than here in the UK. And then obviously when they come to us at university, they've got experience of using this, so we can use it straight away and hit the ground running. Um, but the students need that, that time to be able to um, have a play around and, and look at the different features um, of that. And, and I really feel quite strongly as well that I really feel that statistics um, should be a separate discipline, a separate subject from mathematics, um, pre-university, um, and it needs to be taught separately. But there's lots of, other, lots of issues around that, but I know people have been saying this for decades, um, but I'm a really strong proponent of um, maths, um, stats being a separate subject from, from maths. So some of the feedback, now I know, no, I know I've cherry picked a, a comment here, but this is quite common. What we see in the students that do this course, this core paper that they have to do, um, the 6,000 students, is that they really enjoy the, these approaches. And they look forward to coming again. Um, and, they, and they think they appreciate the effort that you, you take as a, as a teacher, as an educator, to engage them, but show them the relevance, that data that you're collecting is relevant to them, it's about them. And, and the, the, it's been collected on them all the time in, in apps and um, on databases and software, um, when they're looking at the, um, online, the internet and shopping, data has been collected all the time on them. So it, it's really great to try and pull them in in that way. Now, from some of these activities, um, me and my colleagues, we uh, got some funding and we wrote case studies based on this. So th this is when at um, Auckland University that we wrote, well, I wrote, and it's about how to engage remote learners. And in particular, um, I mean, it goes through a kind of case study approach and, and, and you can see some of the backgrounds I use just to kind of keep them awake and keep them coming back. Um, and some of the feedback, now a student created a TikTok. Now I won't show it because it, <laughs> it makes me cringe. It's a TikTok of my lectures, um, but some of the feedback, it, it really, I think it really, touched me and, and it made me feel quite emotional. I mean, this person in particular, it, it said they made them feel like a person again, it gave them a big cry. Um, and, that, and that for me really made me reaffirm in the projects that I was taking in teaching stats and, and using data from them in this way really helped engage them and make them want to learn more of it. So that, so that was really, um, really great to see. So these are my two of the colleagues that um, I, I still work with, but uh, Anna Ferguson, she's a, uh, a lecturer at Stats Department in Auckland Uni. She's done a lot of really good work in data science and stats and how we teach data science. So not just teaching data science, um, so you need to learn a lot of code, but actually how do we teach this in a more meaningful way? 
applied with the statistics. And Emma Lurk was also a colleague of mine that we, we did a lot of these activities together live in the classroom, in the lecture hall, but also remotely. And we also came up with a blog. Um, it's a free blog um, and it's linked to journal articles based on this. So trying to create an evidence base and, and to, to convince people that these, these activities and approaches do work. They make a difference in the classroom. They make a difference to students learning. Uh, and you can see if you, I mean, you can look at this in your own time. It's called Go Big or Go Home. And we stopped writing them in, in the end of 2020, but there's lots of really useful ideas in there about how to um, help decide what context to use, how to teach distributions in stats, um, and how to launch tutorials. So quite, quite a, a broad range. Some of the language we use, what do we mean by unusual when looking at distributions? So that's a, a great resource that you can look at that, that's free. Now, just a kind of brief reflections on this. So uh, these things obviously do take time. The students love and appreciate these activities. They take great ownership of the learning and they'll keep coming back. Uh, me personally, I found it hugely satisfying that the responses I was getting and I, I was kind of switching on those light bulbs in these students and they, they wanted to do more stats, which was great, but they will see differently. And I recognize that these approaches are not always everyone's, not everyone's gonna go to the extent perhaps that I did, but I suppose my advice would be, my take home message would be just try something a bit different with your teaching or take a little risk or, or try and build it in some way in your, in your lectures and give just a small amount of time to students in terms of whether that's choice, you, you, they get to decide what happens in that learning space or that you collect data and use it from them. And I'm sure um, a lot of you use some of these, these approaches anyway, but th this is my reflection and these are my, this is what I've done. Okay, um, the second part of my talk I'm gonna go into. Now I will say I, I had built in two kind of pit stops links to padlets where I would like people to contribute to. So it, it, it won't just be me talking in the next uh, half an hour. So I, I do have a little, two little pit stops that are coming up. So the next talk, the next part of my talk is um, called challenging data um, and context. So going back to this quote that I mentioned earlier about uh, the Tuki saying it's great that we can go in everyone's backyard and, and we can draw on different contexts and different disciplines. Um, but really important question, what do those backyards look like? And in particular, um, when we look at statistics and the importance of context, do we want to be in them? Do we feel confident exploring those different contexts and using those different contexts in the teaching of stats? And what are the, what's the value of using them? Why, why even bother choosing context? Why don't we just teach stats throwing die and, uh, dice and, and, and picking up dominoes and picking cards. Why didn't we just use those examples? So we know, and as I alluded to earlier, the world is full of data that can often include controversial or sensitive topics. Um, and we know that data can come in many different forms. It can be used in a variety of contexts, and you can even use the same data to explore different contexts. And context, the important thing is the context and subject matter give data, can give data a new lease of life, can convey messages in different ways, and the receiver, the person on the other end, can, can take these different, uh, these different contexts and subject matter and interpret it in different ways, uh, both in, in, on an individual level and also in terms of different cross-sections of society. So the way I define challenging data is that um, it's when any data set is assigned to a controversial or potentially sensitive topic that can be emotionally triggering, upsetting, or cause distress. So what I'd like you to do for a few minutes, if you just, um, I will um, copy, I'll, I will copy this in the um, chat, this little um, Padlet link, and I will ask if you could, if you could contribute to this uh, Padlet. Now there are already other contributions there. So um, if you could give that a go and then I'll um, come back together in a few minutes.
It's always great when you see at the top of the um, web page, a little kind of bar, people typing, waiting in anticipation what they're gonna <laughs> what they're gonna post. Okay, I'll give another minute. There's some really good um, points that have popped up here. So just one more minute. Okay, so um, let, I, I'm sure you can all see, um, those of you that clicked on this, you can all see some of the comments and, and I think they're really, some really useful ideas here. So I'll just address a few of them. Um, lots of people kind of seem quite supportive, um, saying that it's great, it brings things alive. It, it shows you that real world data is messy. Um, it's fun. I, this is a really important point here in terms of, um, and I will pose a framework and I think somebody else asked, how do you know how to do this and, and, and what approaches do you do? And, I, and I've given you some suggestions. I'll give you some suggestions in a moment. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it is really important how you navigate this and how you present it. And in particular, um, I would just say, um, I had a, an experience where I um, was talking about what I, I felt to be fairly um, say neutral, topics that was on HIV rates in New Zealand and also we're looking at homelessness in um, Los Angeles and, and homelessness in California and um, a student uh, approached me after the lecture very upset they were very um, they, they said that I shouldn't be using data sets um, based on these things because um, I should be using more neutral data sets like data sets on roller coasters and, and football matches um, and they were really picking on the terms I was using, they didn't like the word HIV because um, they didn't like the word AIDS because it suggested that it placed blame on the individual who acquired, who got HIV and then developed AIDS. So I asked that person to put it all in email to me and I replied to them. My main response was, um, I think as educators, we, 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 we need to show our students the real world and we need to show them that these things exist in reality. And I think we're doing them a disservice if we shield them from that. Now, obviously there's, we can, present it in a way that um, that perhaps we need to be mindful of the topics we choose and we think about um, and, and perhaps after a while of teaching your students, you start to get a feel um, from the reactions in the room, the types of things that you, you know might perhaps upset some people or not. Um, but I, I really feel like we need to talk about this in, in more detail and, and share experiences, um, but also do it because it is so important and I feel very strongly. I would say some of this also, this, this area that I, I've developed and, and I feel quite strongly about, it also came from, um, I'm writing a book at the moment and editors that were looking at a few chapters that I submitted um, wanted me to take out some topics. And, and again, I um, felt quite strongly that um, I didn't want to. And we, we kind of came to a halfway to being where I wrote a series of guidelines, a kind of fr a, a framework, as it were, and how we build it into our teaching it. And we, um, I suppose, explain to our students why we're doing it and the reason for it and why they need to know about it. Okay. So, so the, the my kind of, I suppose, framework or, or uh, suggestions on how you can, you can do this and how you incorporate this um, to students is, 
um, get them to think about what the topic is assigned to. Is it to do with perhaps gender diversity, religion, politics, health? Um, and how does it make them feel? Does it mean something personal to them? And then really try to turn it around and get them to think, well, why do you think the lecturer has chosen this topic? Perhaps it might be set for an assessment or assignment. Um, what does it tell you about the world? Is it interesting? What issue is it tackling or getting you to think about? So trying to get them to think, think about the topic from a critical, um, critical perspective, critical thinking perspective. Um, and th also think about why it's collected. And we know all data that's collected in some ways has an agenda behind it, a bias. Somebody somewhere has collected that data for a reason. And we know a lot of data uh, tends to be collected based on um, Western white males. So, so we, and there's a lot of writing that's been done around this. And um, there's data coming out and books on queer data, data based on females and ethnic minorities. So I think it's an interesting discussion point. Again, some, some people might not feel confident talking about this, but I think it is really important. And, and, and more fundamental, fundamentally, it influences the way we live. When you look at the metrics they use, for example, to, to make mobile phones and iPhones, they're based on, on male metrics. So then um, how, what are the consequences on, on females using mobile phones? So it, 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 it's a really important subject that I think we, we could and should think about introducing and having in our, in our um, lecture rooms. And also get the students to think about, well, who's the audience? Perhaps that you're using a certain report or you might be using a, a media article um, for the students to look at, getting to think about um, who the audience is. So, as I said, I feel quite strongly about this, that we, we need to discuss this and also think of ways to introduce this into our teaching in a safe, in a safe and inclusive way. So that leads on nicely to um, my next kind of part of, of this second part and looking at context and, and, and why is context so important and why do we need to um, think about this? Um, so we know context matters. It's hugely important in teaching, in teaching statistics. Um, and again, linking back to John Tukey's um, quotes, it's great because it permeates in many different areas. Um, but I think quite what we need to do is to get our students, particularly in stats, to take a step back and think more about the data um, and, and what, it, what it is. How is it created? Do you trust it? What are we willing to accept as legitimate knowledge? And what are the ways we collect data and think about creating new knowledge? And what I'm talking about here are um, ontology and epistemology, and it's something um, I know PhD students struggle with, my, my own doctoral students, um, they struggle with these concepts and these terms. I mean, I think we need to try and bring it in earlier on. And um, when I teach intro stats, I just flip this up and talk about it for five, 10 minutes. Nothing too onerous, but just to, to highlight to students, or actually it is important that we think about, well, um, what do we accept as legitimate? Why do we see this data we've collected as being trustworthy? And how has it influenced the knowledge that it's created? Uh, and, and how, how do we think about it, um, our ont ontological type of questions and questions about existence and being? I mean, you can obviously go down that route of becoming very philosophical and it, it gets a bit too deep for me, but an awareness I think is important um, that we mention this to our students in, in stats. Now we, we know that, uh, moving on to context, so we know that um, the world is full of interesting things and, and and for all of us, we have many different perhaps hobbies or interests, and we have reasons for why we, we like those things and, and we find them interesting. So what topics do you use when teaching statistics and how do you use them? So I'd like, um, again, just a, another little pit stop. Um, I'll put this in the chat and I'd like you just to, for about three minutes, type that in, um, contribute to that Padlet and we'll um, have a primary in a few minutes. Thanks, David.
Okay, really great, um, great posters. Just th thanks very much for your contributions. Um, I, and I really like a lot of these now. And, and I suppose some of these do come from, I mean, this is great. Uh, so things that they might not think of like um, Netflix data, um, and you can then move on to things like algorithms and AI and, and, and how they kind of suggest certain, certain movies to you. You can do that with, with music as well. Um, clinical cases, lots of really, really interesting topics. I mean, worldometers is a great thing as well, looking at some of those dynamic displays, um, like death rates, birth rates, and, and how they change. Um, so that, that's really good. Um, so really, really nice examples. I, I would say somebody, I don't care as long as you explain why something needs to be calculated. I think that's from another talk. Um, and I only just, I only picked on that, up on that yesterday, but we'll, we'll just part that for now. And um, yeah, leave it there. So, so, um, so why bother spending time to find interesting context? And I think if people that posted on that Padlet um, alluded to and gave some of the reasons, which are, which are really good. And what are the advantages of taking these approaches? And as we've already talked about challenging data and the, the data that can be emotive or cause um, perhaps upset, what are the, some of the concerns and how do we perhaps manage that? And how can we think about that? So a, a really good elephant or cat in the room is obviously things that I find interesting. My students might not find interesting, right? We all have different interests. I mean, I, I remember um, when I was an undergrad, the uh, lecturers would sometimes say, oh, did you watch this on the news? I'm thinking, no, I don't watch the news. And now I've gotten older, I watch the news. So it's kind of, um, you think, well, what, what do I choose? What do I think is interesting? I'm trying to engage students. What, what do I choose? So we know context is super important um, and, and there's lots of evidence to support this. Which context do you choose? Do you choose interdisciplinary context, which adds a layer of complexity? Um, do you have confidence in using the context as well as the statistical terms? And I think sometimes when we present students with context, um, we rely on them to make those conceptual leaps. So say they're learning a certain statistical technique with one context, we, get, we then rely on them to pick that technique and apply it to another context. It's not always as simple as that. There, there's disciplinary differences or, or, or methods or context in that disciplinary topic that sometimes we, we should try and perhaps help give students a bit more uh, guidance with. But when you use these approaches and, and teach stats, particularly from a, perhaps a, more of a context-based or, or having that discipline at the front, it does change the identity of what you're delivering. And, and my experience, when you use that approach, students tend to uh, see it differently and they want to do more of it. So for me, it's a, it, it, it's a winner. So trying to build in active learning approaches around the context that you use. Now, I've, I've used lots of different contexts in, in my teaching, particularly in this massive and 6,000 student um, uh, module. And I would just say that each, that's across three semesters. So per semester, we'd be teaching about two and a half thousand students. Um, and I would be lecturing, say, 700 students in a, in a lecture hall. So a lot of students to, to, to try and engage. Um, but um, some examples I'm going to kind of, Kind of throw at you and show you the things that I've used. So um, I've used examples like um, we all say thank you. So it's a TED talk. TED talks I think are really good. And I ask students, um, do they anything surprising about the video in the thank you? And then I just basically ask them to think about how they rate themselves in terms of giving praise, who's more likely to give praise, what makes a thank you genuine. So trying to get them to think about the parameter, what we're actually measuring and um, what we would include in that um, kind of data collection and how that links to uh, perhaps psychology and, and social science. Now, I would, I would say a never ending source of uh, inspiration and, and um, that I've used in my lectures is the TV show This Morning. It's fantastic because they often choose topics, sometimes fairly serious, they impact people's lives, but they, they do it in a kind of silly way that's not threatening to students and it means that they can all kind of share their opinion. They'll probably have an opinion on a topic that's been discussed or talked about. So it's not that kind of right or wrong um, perspective. And there was one topic recently, um, it's a should you some bed naked, you're on garden. So I'll show them a few minutes. And then I ask the students to think about who's the most convincing and just try and prime them, prime them and think about, well, how are they using data? The people that are talking, are they reporting percentages? How are they, 
embed, embedding that in their arguments and, and getting to think, think about the data being presented critically. And one example that I've used quite a lot, um, which does make me chuckle even now when I watch this video clip, um, it's a, a video clip with um, Kim Woodburn and um, a, another person, and whether it's okay to call people love or darling, and they and they I asked them to think who's the most convincing. It was about four minutes, four minutes long, five minutes long, not not particularly long video, and then I get them to uh, formatively just to design an experiment or observational study to investigate whether people like being called love or darling, and uh, and then think about research questions and get them to think about defining the parameter around that. So obviously a lot of what I'm talking about here build, builds on research methods and how we think about statistics and how that links together. So um, creating your own arguments, your own views, um, how do you do that using data uh, and looking at the facts and, and linking that into the PB DAC cycle. So it's a, um, a term that was developed by uh, former colleagues of mine, Maxim Van Kook and Chris Wilde in Auckland. So it's essentially the scientific method. So it's kind of planning. Um, looking at the data, analyzing, concluding, thinking about the problem. So um, that's a really nice way to frame um, students thinking around st statistics and, and how you collect data. And then I just, as I said, just kind of prime them, think about um, if I'm using video clips, think about the parameter being investigated, how do you define it, and what methods do you use, and, and think about research questions and ethical considerations. So students really respond well to things like this um, in my experience. Now I'm conscious of time so I, I, I'm going to move on to the last topic. It isn't, it isn't, it's the shortest part of the talk um, but it is a really important part of my talk. Um, so it's statistical literacy so it's pulling together all the different threads of what I've talked about and getting students to think about how do we pull all these different skills that we, we, we've looking at together and create a, a coherent narrative or, or something that kind of makes sense. So statistical literacy is the ability to understand and reason with stats and data. And it usually involves telling data stories. So it's kind of coming up with a narrative. You're giving um, a series of events or facts in, in a certain order so the reader can make connections, trying to, usually trying to convince them of, of a certain perspective, a certain side of an argument or topic. Um, it, data on its own can be just a collection of numbers, which but it does require further explanation um, and, and, and context. And what you can do with a data story is pull the reader into a certain perspective you might have and using visualizations as part of that, or so plots or graphs or, or whatever you're using, if it's a dynamic display online, can help the reader make connections. Um, and we really want, um, as I said, our, our students to see what we're trying to get them to look at and, and interpret things like this and using plots and graphs uh, and embed them together. But obviously we also do need to think about the um, essential math skills. So those skills that I, I think often, I mean, I've found, and I've been quite surprised as students come to university and, and that intro stats course I've talked about, it's a first year course, uh, uh, an introductory course, but there's quite, big gaps in students, uh, what, what I'd see is, I mean, th this is a book that I've written, by the way, so it's a, a shameless plug, um, but I couldn't call it basic or fundamental maths, I'd call it essential maths, but it, uh, it is basic. I mean, this book starts off with percentages, decimal points, uh, integers, proportions, things that students should have learned in, in primary school, but they come to us and, and they're having difficulty. So I think part of the reason for this is um, a lot of students have that two year gap, um, and they kind of don't use it, you lose it. So they have a two year gap during their A-level years, year 12 and 13, where they might not do a, a, a subject that has any sort of maths in it. And what we're trying to do here is just to, to pull, pull them back up and, and get them to uh, learn these essential skills that they need for stats. So what this book tries to do is to introduce them into descriptive data and variables and levels of measurement um, and, and getting them to be statistically literate using real world data. Okay, so this is my aim to try and help students when I wrote this book, to get them um, hooked in. Because when they get to university, a lot of the time, like psychology students, business, I don't think they're always aware of how much stats they're gonna have to do. Um, and I think this is a, perhaps a nice way to, to remind them or, or introduce it to them gently. And 
trying to pull these things together. And, I, and I, again, I think this is a, perhaps an area that's sometimes overlooked, is telling stories with descriptive data, which can be used to craft a, a, a beautiful narrative. Um, and it can help in a number of ways um, that I've, I've kind of listed there. Right, um, so coming to the end of the talk, now a really important thing that I want to mention, and I know a few of you have talked about this um, uh, before, um, I was asked to revive the former um, Royal Stats Society Centre that used to sit at Plymouth, the Centre for uh, Stats Education, and um, it's been launched in, and developed here in Surrey University, and you can see this is a, a kind of proposal, of the different activities that I, I plan to do with the centre. I really feel that statistics needs this kind of voice to pull the different strands and different work, like centres like the Alan Turing Institute do and the ONS and, um, and Talmud and different parts and, and try and pull them together into this um, kind of give, give, give everyone a voice for stats education and, and, and try and help each other um, in ways that we're doing, obviously, in, in, in groups like this, um, but really try and also try and make a difference, um, perhaps politically, and think about how, how we do stats and teach data science and get students to use software earlier on in, in their uh, education. So final quote for me, um, really, I think we're really good, and the way I try and uh, teach stats and, and get students to think about stats, is the human side of doing stats and producing good research questions and survey data, interpreting and communicating data really important and figuring out the types of variables they're working with versus um, getting students to do things, um, leave some things for the computer to do like calculate a test statistic or a variance. So I will leave it there. Um, thank you very much for listening and engaging with me. And I'm very happy now to uh, take questions. Thank you. Right. Yes. No. Thank. Thank you very much. I think we'll, we can do some applause there. Um, we can also do it via via reactions. Thank you for that great talk. And uh, we can do it that. Oh, I've, I've raised my hand. I've not. I've... <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, that, that, that's what I'm intended to do, because what I wanted to say is because if you want to uh, ask a question, then you can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand like I have just done. I have just demonstrated. Right now, inst instead, I'll lower my hand. And uh, this time, look, I'll give you a round of applause and uh, look for people putting questions in the chat or <clears throat> asking a uh, putting their hand up to ask a question. <clears throat> Uh, otherwise, I have to think of a, a question. Um, uh, how, how about the question, can you show us the TikTok? <laughs> you don't have to, you don't have to. It's so cringe. I mean, that, the link I've sent you, you can you can find it. It's in that um, TLOD link that I've, I've um, included in the PowerPoint. So if you do really want to see it, um, I, I suppose what really what was really nice about that is that the students took my lectures and reinterpreted it in their own words. And I think they also did that, they had a Facebook group and they would create memes um, on some of the terms I was using. So there was a, a really funny meme um, with Robin, um, with Batman slapping Robin, because he was using the wrong terms and how you um, communicate yeah. p-values. So it's, it's really nice when you see students reinterpret the theories and concepts you're teaching them in their own words, because you feel like they're, they're learning and they're actually understanding and engaging. Right, indeed. Yeah, and, and some some people, um, uh, you know, so, some lectures are tempted to do things like TikToks and memes and and things like that. Are you uh, tempted at all? Well, what's that using? Uh, say that again, sorry. Uh, people, some people do use TikTok in their teaching and memes. You know, create their own memes. I mean, are you tempted at all? Um, well, I with the memes, I actually. I, I encourage students to do them, and then I'll show them in the lectures. So um, I. I there's another talk that I give based on developing student leadership and how you use um, work with students. And in that module I you, uh, taught on in Auckland, there's a student reps that we had in, in each stream. And one student, they were so proactive and they um, helped to, I mean, the, the example I gave where they came up with their own name, um, I said to the students, look, if you um, come up with a logo, I will print them out as um, little stickies and then you can use them. And 
the students went feral. I mean, they, really, I, they literally were fighting for them. And I, I had emails weeks after, and then he left it. I was thinking, this is just stickers to put on your laptops and your back bags. But I think what that really, really showed is that they, um, they, I took something that they created and then, and then give it to them and they felt they helped their identity. Right, indeed, indeed. Um, now, I know we're slightly over time. So um, one of the great things about having uh, online uh, meetings is that people can just sneak out if they want to. So I, I think if people w wish to leave at this point, then that's fine. Um, we do have a, a few questions. So do you, do you mind hanging around for a few minutes more, Reese? while we- Yeah, 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 that's fine, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. That, that'll be good. And uh, then, you know, if people do have to go to exam boards or whatever, they can uh, catch up later on. So we've had, we've got some questions come in now. Um, uh, Andrew says, I agree hundred percent with everything said and use quite a lot myself, but I think I like the energy. How do you get that level of participation? Yeah, that, that's a really good point. And, and I think it, um, I think it links to another point um, down below in terms of um, not all lecturers have the extra time, sourcing data sets and, 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 and X, Y, and Z. I suppose my kind of wearing my, uh, my associate dean education hat as well is I've encouraged colleagues just to, to do something a bit different in their teaching. It doesn't have to be, I mean, as I said, I think I went over, <laughs> I really went overboard. And I would just add that for eventually I convinced my head of department, my former university to have a, a dedicated online stream. So that gave me the time to develop some of these things. So I actually convinced him to do this, but just to try something a little different, take a bit of a risk or do something a bit different in your teaching and then see how it goes and pilot it. So I'm not asking to um, source lots of different data sets and, and, and do that completely, but just try something a little little different. And then over time, you might find that it, it builds up into a bank. Um, so it kind of baby steps. And I, I'm, quite, I'm aware of people's workloads and, and we're all busy people, but um, the, the benefits and the advantages of doing these things, you, you, you just see it in the students. And, and just sometimes it doesn't work, but when it does work, it's just fantastic. And that's what we're trying to do is engage um, our young people and get them interested in statistics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've got another question here about the differences between the, the this, uh, this is about teaching on introductory statistics. Do you have any thoughts on teaching postgrads? So in MSc programs, what, yeah, what might be similar? What might, what, what might you do differently? That's a really good question. And now, again, it depends on the postgrad program. Um, I would just say there's clearly some overlap. So, I mean, you, postgrad courses, you have students coming in at different ages, have different, they're coming in with different things. So some of the approaches that I presented, I think still work quite well. Um, and it just gently introduces them to statistics. Um, and, and, and some of the other things I've talked about, obviously, are using interesting, engaging data sets, you can start to do that. Now, there are sources that you can look to and, and they are clean and that and they have been um kind of uh, tidied up uh, and this is something i hope the center that i mentioned the center for stats and data science can help with to create and, and have a page of, of of usable data sets that are that are clean and, and students can actually use and i would just say I, I mean i myself have used quite a lot of government based websites and data sets that they present i mean they they can be a bit messy, but some of them are, are fairly clean. And, and again, it's good to sometimes show students the dirty version and then the clean version, because you can show them why it's dirty or, or messy and why it doesn't work in software like Insights and, and, and that sort of thing. And the issues that you can come into that statisticians and data analysts have to deal with. OK, well, I think one of the other questions you, you've answered, and there's, there's, there's a question um, about differences between the, the, relevant, the, the relative benefits of free and expensive software, um, which um, uh, about R and Minitab. And I, I, can, I can remember having these, these big discussions um, many years ago, <laughs> nearly 30 years ago, um, about that. So I don't know whether we want to open that war or not. Uh, about I mean, I, I, suppose just, I suppose just briefly, I mean, I, I suppose some of this is dependent on discipline, certain disciplines. Um, I mean, at Auckland, we use SPSS because um, psychology was still using it and biosciences. Sometimes it depends on the lecturer and they, if you have lecturers who are doing research and they're using certain software, they we usually have, they're comfortable with say using R or using a uh, mini type. And then that tends to be what, what they use in their papers, particularly 
second, third year, postgrad. Um, but we would we moved to using Insight in R. I mean, R was created in Auckland Uni between Computer Science and, and, and Statistics Department. So we would we would we'd start using R and getting students to to understand um, or getting to write code and 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 type code into it. I mean, as you said, that you could do a whole other talk on this. Um, but and I think it depends on discipline, the lecturer, what they're comfortable with using, and obviously, as you mentioned, kind of whether it's free or whether you have to pay for it. I mean, you. It, I mean, even getting students to use Excel well is, is another skill in itself. I think when when students go out into the the real world and, and work with employers, a lot of employers are not using XPSS or using some of these software you have to pay for. So that, that's something else to perhaps consider as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, thanks very much. I, I think we should uh, wrap it over, uh, wrap it up there because we've we've gone slightly over time, but um, I'm, I'm sure that's fine. Um, people are happy with such a great talk. Very very interesting. Thank you. Very much. So can we? Uh, I mean, you can turn your microphones on and give one of those round of applause or turn your um, cameras on, give a round of applause and you can use the reactions, not put your hand up, <laughs> the, giving them away, your thumbs up and things like that. Um, so um, on behalf of uh, Michael and Rachel, unless they want to say something, I, um, I think we'll, we'll finish it there. Or Michael, Rachel, do you have anything further to say? I, I think just to say thanks to Reese for um, a fantastic way of ending the Talmo sessions this academic year and, and obviously to you and, and, and Rachel for all the work keeping Talmo going and uh, we'll see everybody back in what September or October. Have a wonderful summer and most importantly I hope everyone gets a, a proper break this year. Yeah and also to say don't forget to fill in the form as well for your suggestions for Talmo going forwards. Remember it's something for the whole community so we want to do stuff that all of us are engaged with. So please do fill in that form. And thank you very much, Reese. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Take care.